such was the house, the household, and the business Mr. Verloc left behind him on his way westward at the hour of half-past ten in the morning. It was unusually early for him, his whole person exhaled the charm of almost dewy freshness, he wore his blue cloth overcoat unbuttoned, his boots were shiny, his cheeks, freshly shaven, had a sort of gloss, and even his heavy-lidded eyes, refreshed by a night of peaceful slumber, sent out glances of comparative alertness. Through the park railings these glances beheld men and women riding in the row, couples cantering past harmoniously, others advancing sedately at a walk, loitering groups of three or four, solitary horsemen looking unsociable, and solitary women followed at a long distance by a groom with a cockade to his hat and a leather belt over his tight-fitting coat. Carriages went bowling by, mostly two-horse brooms, with here and there a Victoria with the skin of some wild beast inside and a woman's face and hat emerging above the folded hood. And a peculiarly London sun, against which nothing could be said except that it looked bloodshot, glorified all this by its stare. It hung at a moderate elevation above Hyde Park Corner with an air of punctual and benign vigilance. The very pavement under Mr. Verloc's feet had an old gold tinge in that diffused light, in which neither wall, nor tree, nor beast, nor man cast a shadow. Mr. Verloc was going westward through a town without shadows in an atmosphere of powdered old gold. There were red, coppery gleams on the roofs of houses, on the corners of walls, on the panels of carriages, on the very coats of the horses, and on the broad back of Mr. Verloc's overcoat, where they produced a dull effect of rustiness. But Mr. Verloc was not in the least conscious of having got rusty. He surveyed through the park railings the evidences of the town's opulence and luxury with an approving eye. All these people had to be protected. Protection is the first necessity of opulence and luxury. They had to be protected, and their horses, carriages, houses, servants had to be protected, and the source of their wealth had to be protected in the heart of the city and the heart of the country, the whole social order favorable to their hygienic idleness had to be protected against the shallow enviousness of unhygienic labor. It had to, and Mr. Verloc would have rubbed his hands with satisfaction had he not been constitutionally averse from every superfluous exertion. His idleness was not hygienic, but it suited him very well. He was in a manner devoted to it with a sort of inert fanaticism, or perhaps rather with a fanatical inertness. Born of industrious parents for a life of toil, he had embraced indolence from an impulse as profound as inexplicable and as imperious as the impulse which directs a man's preference for one particular woman in a given thousand. He was too lazy even for a mere demagogue, for a workman orator, for a leader of labor. It was too much trouble. He required a more perfect form of ease, or it might have been that he was the victim of a philosophical unbelief in the effectiveness of every human effort. Such a form of indolence requires, implies, a certain amount of intelligence. Mr. Verloc was not devoid of intelligence, and at the notion of a menaced social order he would perhaps have winked to himself if there had not been an effort to make in that sign of skepticism. His big, prominent eyes were not well adapted to winking. They were rather of the sort that closes solemnly in slumber with majestic effect. Undemonstrative and burly in a fat pig style, Mr. Verloc, without either rubbing his hands with satisfaction or winking skeptically at his thoughts, proceeded on his way. He trod the pavement heavily with his shiny boots, and his general get-up was that of a well-to-do mechanic in business for himself. He might have been anything from a picture-frame maker to a locksmith, an employer of labor in a small way. But there was also about him an indescribable air which no mechanic could have acquired in the practice of his handicraft however dishonestly exercised, the air common to men who live on the vices, the follies, or the baser fears of mankind, the air of moral nihilism common to keepers of gambling hells and disorderly houses, to private detectives and inquiry agents, to drink sellers and, I should say, to the sellers of invigorating electric belts and to the inventors of patent medicines. But of that last I am not sure, not having carried my investigations so far into the depths. For all I know, the expression of these last may be perfectly diabolic. I shouldn't be surprised. What I want to affirm is that Mr. Verloc's expression was by no means diabolic. Before reaching Knightsbridge, 
Mr. Verloc took a turn to the left out of the busy main thoroughfare, uproarious with the traffic of swaying omnibuses and trotting vans, in the almost silent, swift flow of hansoms. Under his hat, worn with a slight backward tilt, his hair had been carefully brushed into respectful sleekness, for his business was with an embassy. And Mr. Verloc, steady like a rock, a soft kind of rock, marched now along a street which could with every propriety be described as private. In its breadth, emptiness, and extent it had the majesty of inorganic nature, of matter that never dies. The only reminder of mortality was a doctor's brougham arrested in August solitude close to the curbstone. The polished knockers of the doors gleamed as far as the eye could reach, the clean windows shone with a dark opaque luster. And all was still. But a milk cart rattled noisily across the distant perspective, a butcher boy, driving with the noble recklessness of a charioteer at Olympic Games, dashed round the corner sitting high above a pair of red wheels. A guilty-looking cat issuing from under the stones ran for a while in front of Mr. Verloc, then dived into another basement, and a thick police constable, looking a stranger to every emotion, as if he too were part of inorganic nature, surging apparently out of a lamppost, took not the slightest notice of Mr. Verloc. With a turn to the left Mr. Verloc pursued his way along a narrow street by the side of a yellow wall which, for some inscrutable reason, had number one Chesham Square written on it in black letters. Chesham Square was at least sixty yards away, and Mr. Verloc, cosmopolitan enough not to be deceived by London's topographical mysteries, held on steadily, without a sign of surprise or indignation. At last, with businesslike persistency, he reached the square, and made diagonally for the number 10. This belonged to an imposing carriage gate in a high, clean wall between two houses, of which one rationally enough bore the number 9 and the other was number 37, but the fact that this last belonged to Port Hill Street, a street well known in the neighborhood, was proclaimed by an inscription placed above the ground floor windows by whatever highly efficient authority is charged with the duty of keeping track of London straight houses. Why powers are not asked of Parliament, a short act would do for compelling those edifices to return where they belong is one of the mysteries of municipal administration. Mr. Verloc did not trouble his head about it, his mission in life being the protection of the social mechanism, not its perfectionment or even its criticism. It was so early that the porter of the embassy issued hurriedly out of his lodge still struggling with the left sleeve of his livery coat. His waistcoat was red, and he wore knee breeches, but his aspect was flustered. Mr. Verloc, aware of the rush on his flank, drove it off by simply holding out an envelope stamped with the arms of the embassy, and passed on. He produced the same talisman also to the footman who opened the door, and stood back to let him enter the hall. A clear fire burned in a tall fireplace, and an elderly man standing with his back to it, in evening dress and with a chain round his neck, glanced up from the newspaper he was holding spread out in both hands before his calm and severe face. He didn't move, but another lackey, in brown trousers and claw hammer coat edged with thin yellow cord, approaching Mr. Verloc listened to the murmur of his name, and turning round on his heel in silence, began to walk, without looking back once. Mr. Verloc, thus led along a ground-floor passage to the left of the great carpeted staircase, was suddenly motioned to enter a quite small room furnished with a heavy writing table and a few chairs. The servant shut the door, and Mr. Verloc remained alone. He did not take a seat. With his hat and stick held in one hand he glanced about, passing his other podgy hand over his uncovered sleek head. Another door opened noiselessly, and Mr. Verloc immobilizing his glance in that direction saw at first only black clothes, the bald top of a head, and a drooping dark grey whisker on each side of a pair of wrinkled hands. The person who had entered was holding a batch of papers before his eyes and walked up to the table with a rather mincing step, turning the papers over the while. Privy Councillor Wernt, Chancellor D. Ambassad, was rather short-sighted. This meritorious official laying the papers on the table, disclosed a face of pasty complexion and of melancholy ugliness surrounded by a lot of fine, long dark grey hairs, barred heavily by thick and bushy eyebrows. He put on a black-framed pince-nez upon a blunt and shapeless nose, and seemed struck by Mr. Verloc's appearance. Under the enormous eyebrows his weak eyes blinked pathetically through the glasses.
He made no sign of greeting, neither did Mr. Verloc, who certainly knew his place, but a subtle change about the general outlines of his shoulders and back suggested a slight bending of Mr. Verloc's spine under the vast surface of his overcoat. The effect was of unobtrusive deference. I have here some of your reports, said the bureaucrat in an unexpectedly soft and weary voice, and pressing the tip of his forefinger on the papers with force. He paused, and Mr. Verloc, who had recognized his own handwriting very well, waited in an almost breathless silence. We are not very satisfied with the attitude of the police here, the other continued, with every appearance of mental fatigue. The shoulders of Mr. Verloc, without actually moving, suggested a shrug. And for the first time since he left his home that morning his lips opened. Every country has its police, he said philosophically. But as the official of the embassy went on blinking at him steadily he felt constrained to add, allow me to observe that I have no means of action upon the police here. What is desired, said the man of papers, is the occurrence of something definite which should stimulate their vigilance. That is within your province, is it not so? Mr. Verloc made no answer except by a sigh, which escaped him involuntarily, for instantly he tried to give his face a cheerful expression. The official blinked doubtfully, as if affected by the dim light of the room. He repeated vaguely. The vigilance of the police and the severity of the magistrates. The general leniency of the judicial procedure here, and the utter absence of all repressive measures, are a scandal to Europe. What is wished for just now is the accentuation of the unrest of the fermentation which undoubtedly exists. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, broken Mr. Verloc in a deep deferential base of an oratorical quality, so utterly different from the tone in which he had spoken before that his interlocutor remained profoundly surprised. It exists to a dangerous degree. My reports for the last twelve months make it sufficiently clear. Your reports for the last twelve months, State Councillor Worm began in his gentle and dispassionate tone, have been read by me. I failed to discover why you wrote them at all. A sad silence reigned for a time. Mr. Verloc seemed to have swallowed his tongue, and the other gazed at the papers on the table fixedly. At last he gave them a slight push. The state of affairs you expose there is assumed to exist as the first condition of your employment. What is required at present is not writing, but the bringing to light of a distinct, significant fact, I would almost say of an alarming fact. I need not say that all my endeavors shall be directed to that end, Mr. Verloc said, with convinced modulations in his conversational husky tone. But the sense of being blinked at watchfully behind the blind glitter of these eyeglasses on the other side of the table disconcerted him. He stopped short with a gesture of absolute devotion. The useful, hard-working, if obscure member of the embassy had an air of being impressed by some newly born thought. You are very corpulent, he said. This observation, really of a psychological nature, and advanced with the modest hesitation of an office man more familiar with ink and paper than with the requirements of active life, stung Mr. Verloc in the manner of a rude personal remark. He stepped back a pace. Eh? What were you pleased to say, he exclaimed, with husky resentment. The Chancellor D. Ambassad entrusted with the conduct of this interview seemed to find it too much for him. I think, he said, that you had better see Mr. Vladimir. Yes, decidedly I think you ought to see Mr. Vladimir. Be good enough to wait here, he added, and went out with mincing steps. At once Mr. Verloc passed his hand over his hair. A slight perspiration had broken out on his forehead. He let the air escape from his pursed-up lips like a man blowing at a spoonful of hot soup. But when the servant in brown appeared at the door silently, Mr. Verloc had not moved an inch from the place he had occupied throughout the interview. He had remained motionless, as if feeling himself surrounded by pitfalls. He walked along a passage lighted by a lonely gas jet, 
then up a flight of winding stairs, and through a glazed and cheerful corridor on the first floor. The footman threw open a door and stood aside. The feet of Mr. Verloc felt a thick carpet. The room was large, with three windows, and a young man with a shaven, big face, sitting in a roomy armchair before a vast mahogany writing table, said in French to the Chancellor d'Ambassad, who was going out with the papers in his hand. You are quite right, mon cher. He's fat, the animal. Mr. Vladimir, first secretary, had a drawing-room reputation as an agreeable and entertaining man. He was something of a favorite in society. His wit consisted in discovering droll connections between incongruous ideas, and when talking in that strain he sat well forward of his seat, with his left hand raised, as if exhibiting his funny demonstrations between the thumb and forefinger, while his round and clean-shaven face wore an expression of merry perplexity. But there was no trace of merriment or perplexity in the way he looked at Mr. Verloc. Lying far back in the deep armchair, with squarely spread elbows, and throwing one leg over a thick knee, he had with his smooth and rosy countenance the air of a preternaturally thriving baby that will not stand nonsense from anybody. You understand French, I suppose, he said. Mr. Verloc stated huskily that he did. His whole vast bulk had a forward inclination. He stood on the carpet in the middle of the room, clutching his hat and stick in one hand, the other hung lifelessly by his side. He muttered unobtrusively somewhere deep down in his throat something about having done his military service in the French artillery. At once, with contemptuous perversity, Mr. Vladimir changed the language and began to speak idiomatic English without the slightest trace of a foreign accent. Ah. Yes. Of course. Let's see. How much did you get for obtaining the design of the improved breech block of their new field gun? Five years rigorous confinement in a fortress, Mr. Verloc answered unexpectedly, but without any sign of feeling. You got off easily, was Mr. Vladimir's comment. And, anyhow, it served you right for letting yourself get caught. What made you go in for that sort of thing, eh? Mr. Verloc's husky conversational voice was heard speaking of youth, of a fatal infatuation for an unworthy. Aha! Cherchez la femme, Mr. Vladimir deigned to interrupt, unbending, but without affability, there was, on the contrary, a touch of grimness in his condescension. How long have you been employed by the embassy here? he asked. Ever since the time of the late Baron Stadwartenheim, Mr. Verloc answered in subdued tones, and protruding his lips sadly, in sign of sorrow for the deceased diplomat. The first secretary observed this play of physiognomy steadily. Ah! Ever since. Well! What have you got to say for yourself? he asked sharply. Mr. Verloc answered with some surprise that he was not aware of having anything special to say. He had been summoned by a letter and he plunged his hand busily into the side pocket of his overcoat, but before the mocking, cynical watchfulness of Mr. Vladimir, concluded to leave it there. Bah, said that latter. What do you mean by getting out of condition like this? You haven't got even the physique of your profession. You, a member of a starving proletariat, never. You, a desperate socialist or anarchist, which is it? Anarchist, stated Mr. Verloc in a deadened tone. Bosch, went on Mr. Vladimir, without raising his voice. You startled old wormed himself. You wouldn't deceive an idiot. They all are that by the by, but you seem to me simply impossible. So you began your connection with us by stealing the French gun designs. And you got yourself caught. That must have been very disagreeable to our government. You don't seem to be very smart. Mr. Verloc tried to exculpate himself huskily. As I've had occasion to observe before, a fatal infatuation for an unworthy.
Mr. Vladimir raised a large white, plump hand. Ah, yes. The unlucky attachment of your youth. She got hold of the money and then sold you to the police, eh? The doleful change in Mr. Verloc's physiognomy, the momentary drooping of his whole person, confessed that such was the regrettable case. Mr. Vladimir's hand clasped the ankle reposing on his knee. The sock was of dark blue silk. You see, that was not very clever of you. Perhaps you are too susceptible. Mr. Verloc intimated in a throaty, veiled murmur that he was no longer young. Oh, that's a failing which age does not cure, Mr. Vladimir remarked, with sinister familiarity. But no, you are too fat for that. You could not have come to look like this if you had been at all susceptible. I'll tell you what I think is the matter, you are a lazy fellow. How long have you been drawing pay from this embassy? Eleven years, was the answer, after a moment of sulky hesitation. I've been charged with several missions to London while His Excellency Baron Stott Wartenheim was still ambassador in Paris. Then by His Excellency's instructions I settled down in London. I am English. You are. Are you? Eh? A natural-born British subject, Mr. Verloc said stolidly. But my father was French, and so. Never mind explaining, interrupted the other. I dare say you could have been legally a marshal of France and a member of Parliament in England, and then, indeed, you would have been of some use to our embassy. This flight of fancy provoked something like a faint smile on Mr. Verloc's face. Mr. Vladimir retained an imperturbable gravity. But, as I've said, you are a lazy fellow, you don't use your opportunities. In the time of Baron Stott Wartenheim we had a lot of soft-headed people running this embassy. They caused fellows of your sort to form a false conception of the nature of a secret service fund. It is my business to correct this misapprehension by telling you what the secret service is not. It is not a philanthropic institution. I've had you called here on purpose to tell you this. Mr. Vladimir observed the forced expression of bewilderment on Verloc's face and smiled sarcastically. I see that you understand me perfectly. I dare say you are intelligent enough for your work. What we want now is activity, activity. On repeating this last word Mr. Vladimir laid a long white forefinger on the edge of the desk. Every trace of huskiness disappeared from Verloc's voice. The nape of his gross neck became crimson above the velvet collar of his overcoat. His lips quivered before they came widely open. If you'll only be good enough to look up my record, he boomed out in his great, clear oratorical bass, you'll see I gave a warning only three months ago, on the occasion of the Grand Duke Romuald's visit to Paris, which was telegraphed from here to the French police, and... Tut, tut, broke out Mr. Vladimir, with a frowning grimace. The French police had no use for your warning. Don't roar like this. What the devil do you mean? With a note of proud humility Mr. Verloc apologized for forgetting himself. His voice, famous for years at open-air meetings and at workmen's assemblies in large halls, had contributed, he said, to his reputation of a good and trustworthy comrade. It was, therefore, a part of his usefulness. It had inspired confidence in his principles. I was always put up to speak by the leaders at a critical moment, Mr. Verloc declared, with obvious satisfaction. There was no uproar above which he could not make himself heard, he added, and suddenly he made a demonstration. Allow me, he said. With lowered forehead, without looking up, Swiftly and ponderously he crossed the room to one of the French windows. As if giving way to an uncontrollable impulse, he opened it a little. Mr. Vladimir, jumping up amazed from the depths of the armchair, looked over his shoulder, and below, across the courtyard of the embassy, 
while beyond the open gate, could be seen the broad back of a policeman watching idly the gorgeous perambulator of a wealthy baby being wheeled in state across the square. Constable, said Mr. Verloc, with no more effort than if he were whispering, and Mr. Vladimir burst into a laugh on seeing the policeman spin round as if prodded by a sharp instrument. Mr. Verloc shut the window quietly, and returned to the middle of the room. With a voice like that, he said, putting on the husky conversational pedal, I was naturally trusted. And I knew what to say, too. Mr. Vladimir, arranging his cravat, observed him in the glass over the mantelpiece. I dare say you have the social revolutionary jargon by heart well enough, he said contemptuously. Vox et. You haven't ever studied Latin, have you? No, growled Mr. Verloc. You did not expect me to know it. I belong to the million. Who knows Latin? Only a few hundred imbeciles who aren't fit to take care of themselves. For some thirty seconds longer Mr. Vladimir studied in the mirror the fleshy profile, the gross bulk, of the man behind him. And at the same time he had the advantage of seeing his own face, clean-shaved and round, rosy about the gills, and with the thin sensitive lips formed exactly for the utterance of those delicate witticisms which had made him such a favorite in the very highest society. Then he turned, and advanced into the room with such determination that the very ends of his quaintly old-fashioned bow necktie seemed to bristle with unspeakable menaces. The movement was so swift and fierce that Mr. Verloc, casting an oblique glance, quailed inwardly. Aha! You dare be impudent, Mr. Vladimir began, with an amazingly guttural intonation not only utterly un-English, but absolutely un-European, and startling even to Mr. Verloc's experience of cosmopolitan slums. You dare! Well, I am going to speak plain English to you. Voice won't do. We have no use for your voice. We don't want a voice. We want facts, startling facts, damn you, he added, with a sort of ferocious discretion, right into Mr. Verloc's face. Don't you try to come over me with your hyperborean manners, Mr. Verloc defended himself huskily, looking at the carpet. At this his interlocutor, smiling mockingly above the bristling bow of his necktie, switched the conversation into French. You give yourself for an agent provocateur. The proper business of an agent provocateur is to provoke. As far as I can judge from your record kept here, you have done nothing to earn your money for the last three years. Nothing, exclaimed Verloc, stirring not a limb and not raising his eyes, but with the note of sincere feeling in his tone. I have several times prevented what might have been. There is a proverb in this country which says prevention is better than cure, interrupted Mr. Vladimir, throwing himself into the armchair. It is stupid in a general way. There is no end to prevention. But it is characteristic. They dislike finality in this country. Don't you be too English. And in this particular instance, don't be absurd. The evil is already here. We don't want prevention, we want cure. He paused, turned to the desk, and turning over some papers lying there, spoke in a changed business-like tone, without looking at Mr. Verloc. You know, of course, of the international conference assembled in Milan? Mr. Verloc intimated hoarsely that he was in the habit of reading the daily papers. To a further question his answer was that, of course, he understood what he read. At this Mr. Vladimir, smiling faintly at the documents he was still scanning one after another, murmured, as long as it is not written in Latin, I suppose. Or Chinese, added Mr. Verloc stolidly. Hum. Some of your revolutionary friends' effusions are written in a Carabia every bit as incomprehensible as Chinese, Mr. Vladimir let fall disdainfully a gray sheet of printed matter. What are all these leaflets headed F a P, with a hammer, pen, and torch crossed? What does it mean, this F P?
Mr. Verloc approached the imposing writing table. The future of the proletariat. It's a society, he explained, standing ponderously by the side of the armchair, not anarchist in principle, but open to all shades of revolutionary opinion. Are you in it? One of the vice presidents, Mr. Verloc breathed out heavily, and the first secretary of the embassy raised his head to look at him. Then you ought to be ashamed of yourself, he said incisively. Isn't your society capable of anything else but printing this prophetic bosh and blunt type on this filthy paper, eh? Why don't you do something? Look here. I've this matter in hand now, and I tell you plainly that you will have to earn your money. The good old Stott Wartenheim times are over. No work, no pay. Mr. Verloc felt a queer sensation of faintness in his stout legs. He stepped back one pace and blew his nose loudly. He was, in truth, startled and alarmed. The rusty London sunshine struggling clear of the London mist shed a lukewarm brightness into the first secretary's private room, and in the silence Mr. Verloc heard against a windowpane the faint buzzing of a fly, his first fly of the year, heralding better than any number of swallows the approach of spring. The useless fussing of that tiny energetic organism affected unpleasantly this big man threatened in his indolence. In the pause Mr. Vladimir formulated in his mind a series of disparaging remarks concerning Mr. Verloc's face and figure. The fellow was unexpectedly vulgar, heavy, and impudently unintelligent. He looked uncommonly like a master plumber come to present his bill. The first secretary of the embassy, from his occasional excursions into the field of American humor, had formed a special notion of that class of mechanic as the embodiment of fraudulent laziness and incompetency. This was then the famous and trusty secret agent, so secret that he was never designated otherwise but by the symbol, Delta, in the late Baron Stott Wartenheim's official, semi-official, and confidential correspondence, the celebrated agent, Delta, whose warnings had the power to change the schemes and the dates of royal, imperial, grand ducal journeys, and sometimes caused them to be put off altogether. This fellow. And Mr. Vladimir indulged mentally in an enormous and derisive fit of merriment, partly at his own astonishment, which he judged naive, but mostly at the expense of the universally regretted Baron Stott Wartenheim. His late excellency, whom the august favor of his imperial master had imposed as ambassador upon several reluctant ministers of foreign affairs, had enjoyed in his lifetime a fame for an oulish, pessimistic gullibility. His excellency had the social revolution on the brain. He imagined himself to be a diplomatist set apart by a special dispensation to watch the end of diplomacy, and pretty nearly the end of the world, in a horrid democratic upheaval. His prophetic and doleful dispatches had been for years the joke of foreign offices. He was said to have exclaimed on his deathbed, visited by his imperial friend in master unhappy Europe, Thou shalt perish by the moral insanity of thy children. He was fated to be the victim of the first humbugging rascal that came along, thought Mr. Vladimir, smiling vaguely at Mr. Verloc. You ought to venerate the memory of Baron Stott Wartenheim, he exclaimed suddenly. The lowered physiognomy of Mr. Verloc expressed a somber and weary annoyance. Permit me to observe to you, he said, that I came here because I was summoned by a peremptory letter. I have been here only twice before in the last eleven years, and certainly never at eleven in the morning. It isn't very wise to call me up like this. There is just a chance of being seen. And that would be no joke for me. Mr. Vladimir shrugged his shoulders. It would destroy my usefulness, continued the other hotly. That's your affair, murmured Mr. Vladimir, with soft brutality. When you cease to be useful you shall cease to be employed. Yes. Right off. Cut short. You shall, Mr. Vladimir, frowning, paused, at a loss for a sufficiently idiomatic expression, and instantly brightened up, with a grin of beautifully white teeth. You shall be chucked, he brought out ferociously.
Once more Mr. Verloc had to react with all the force of his will against that sensation of faintness running down one's legs which once upon a time had inspired some poor devil with the felicitous expression, my heart went down into my boots. Mr. Verloc, aware of the sensation, raised his head bravely. Mr. Vladimir bore the look of heavy inquiry with perfect serenity. What we want is to administer a tonic to the conference in Milan, he said airily. Its deliberations upon international action for the suppression of political crime don't seem to get anywhere. England lags. This country is absurd with its sentimental regard for individual liberty. It's intolerable to think that all your friends have got only to come over to. In that way I have them all under my eye, Mr. Verloc interrupted huskily. It would be much more to the point to have them all under lock and key. England must be brought into line. The imbecile bourgeoisie of this country make themselves the accomplices of the very people whose aim is to drive them out of their houses to starve in ditches. And they have the political power still, if they only had the sense to use it for their preservation. I suppose you agree that the middle classes are stupid? Mr. Verloc agreed hoarsely. They are. They have no imagination. They are blinded by an idiotic vanity. What they want just now is a jolly good scare. This is the psychological moment to set your friends to work. I have had you called here to develop to you my idea. And Mr. Vladimir developed his idea from on high, with scorn and condescension, displaying at the same time an amount of ignorance as to the real aims, thoughts, and methods of the revolutionary world which filled the silent Mr. Verloc with inward consternation. He confounded causes with effects more than was excusable, the most distinguished propagandists with impulsive bomb-throwers, assumed organization were in the nature of things it could not exist, spoke of the social revolutionary party one moment as of a perfectly disciplined army, where the word of chiefs was supreme, and at another as if it had been the loosest association of desperate brigands that ever camped in a mountain gorge. Once Mr. Verloc had opened his mouth for a protest, but the raising of a shapely, large white hand arrested him. Very soon he became too appalled to even try to protest. He listened in a stillness of dread which resembled the immobility of profound attention. A series of outrages, Mr. Vladimir continued calmly, executed here in this country, not only planned here, that would not do, they would not mind. Your friends could set half the continent on fire without influencing the public opinion here in favor of a universal repressive legislation. They will not look outside their backyard here. Mr. Verloc cleared his throat, but his heart failed him, and he said nothing. These outrages need not be especially sanguinary, Mr. Vladimir went on, as if delivering a scientific lecture, but they must be sufficiently startling, effective. Let them be directed against buildings, for instance. What is the fetish of the hour that all the bourgeoisie recognize, eh, Mr. Verloc? Mr. Verloc opened his hands and shrugged his shoulders slightly. You are too lazy to think, was Mr. Vladimir's comment upon that gesture. Pay attention to what I say. The fetish of today is neither royalty nor religion. Therefore the palace and the church should be left alone. You understand what I mean, Mr. Verloc? The dismay and the scorn of Mr. Verloc found vent in an attempt at levity. Perfectly. But what of the embassies? A series of attacks on the various embassies, he began, but he could not withstand the cold, watchful stare of the first secretary. You can be facetious, I see, the latter observed carelessly. That's all right. It may enliven your oratory at socialistic congresses. But this room is no place for it. It would be infinitely safer for you to follow carefully what I am saying. As you are being called upon to furnish facts instead of cock and bull stories, you had better try to make your profit off what I am taking the trouble to explain to you.
The sacrosanct fetish of today is science. Why don't you get some of your friends to go for that wooden-faced panjandrum, eh? Is it not part of these institutions which must be swept away before the FP comes along? Mr. Verloc said nothing. He was afraid to open his lips lest a groan should escape him. This is what you should try for. An attempt upon a crowned head or on a president is sensational enough in a way, but not so much as it used to be. It has entered into the general conception of the existence of all chiefs of state. It's almost conventional, especially since so many presidents have been assassinated. Now let us take an outrage upon, say, a church. Horrible enough at first sight, no doubt, and yet not so effective as a person of an ordinary mind might think. No matter how revolutionary an anarchist in inception, there would be fools enough to give such an outrage the character of a religious manifestation. And that would detract from the especial alarming significance we wish to give to the act. A murderous attempt on a restaurant or a theater would suffer in the same way from the suggestion of non-political passion, the exasperation of a hungry man, an act of social revenge. All this is used up, it is no longer instructive as an object lesson in revolutionary anarchism. Every newspaper has ready-made phrases to explain such manifestations away. I am about to give you the philosophy of bomb-throwing from my point of view, from the point of view you pretend to have been serving for the last eleven years. I will try not to talk above your head. The sensibilities of the class you are attacking are soon blunted. Property seems to them an indestructible thing. You can't count upon their emotions either of pity or fear for very long. A bomb outrage to have any influence on public opinion now must go beyond the intention of vengeance or terrorism. It must be purely destructive. It must be that, and only that, beyond the faintest suspicion of any other object. You anarchists should make it clear that you are perfectly determined to make a clean sweep of the whole social creation. But how to get that appallingly absurd notion into the heads of the middle classes so that there should be no mistake? That's the question. By directing your blows at something outside the ordinary passions of humanity is the answer. Of course, there is art. A bomb in the National Gallery would make some noise. But it would not be serious enough. Art has never been their fetish. It's like breaking a few back windows in a man's house, whereas, if you want to make him really sit up, you must try at least to raise the roof. There would be some screaming of course, but from whom? Artists, art critics and such like, people of no account. Nobody minds what they say. But there is learning, science. Any imbecile that has got an income believes in that. He does not know why, but he believes it matters somehow. It is the sacrosanct fetish. All the damned professors are radicals at heart. Let them know that their great panjandrum has got to go too, to make room for the future of the proletariat. A howl from all these intellectual idiots is bound to help forward the labors of the Milan Conference. They will be writing to the papers. Their indignation would be above suspicion, no material interests being openly at stake, and it will alarm every selfishness of the class which should be impressed. They believe that in some mysterious way science is at the source of their material prosperity. They do. And the absurd ferocity of such a demonstration will affect them more profoundly than the mangling of a whole street or theater full of their own kind. To that last they can always say, oh. It's mere class hate. But what is one to say to an act of destructive ferocity so absurd as to be incomprehensible, inexplicable, almost unthinkable, in fact, mad? Madness alone is truly terrifying, inasmuch as you cannot placate it either by threats, persuasion, or bribes. Moreover, I am a civilized man. I would never dream of directing you to organize a mere butchery, even if I expected the best results from it but I wouldn't expect from a butchery the result I want. Murder is always with us. It is almost an institution. The demonstration must be against learning science. But not every science will do.
The attack must have all the shocking senselessness of gratuitous blasphemy. Since bombs are your means of expression, it would be really telling if one could throw a bomb into pure mathematics. But that is impossible. I have been trying to educate you, I have expounded to you the higher philosophy of your usefulness, and suggested to you some serviceable arguments. The practical application of my teaching interests you mostly. But from the moment I have undertaken to interview you I have also given some attention to the practical aspect of the question. What do you think of having a go at astronomy? For some time already Mr. Verloc's immobility by the side of the armchair resembled a state of collapsed coma, a sort of passive insensibility interrupted by slight convulsive starts, such as may be observed in the domestic dog having a nightmare on the hearthrug. And it was in an uneasy dog-like growl that he repeated the word. Astronomy he had not recovered thoroughly as yet from that state of bewilderment brought about by the effort to follow Mr. Vladimir's rapid incisive utterance. It had overcome his power of assimilation. It had made him angry. This anger was complicated by incredulity. And suddenly it dawned upon him that all this was an elaborate joke. Mr. Vladimir exhibited his white teeth in a smile, with dimples on his round, full face posed with a complacent inclination above the bristling bow of his necktie. The favorite of intelligent society women had assumed his drawing-room attitude accompanying the delivery of delicate witticisms. Sitting well forward, his white hand upraised, he seemed to hold delicately between his thumb and forefinger the subtlety of his suggestion. There could be nothing better. Such an outrage combines the greatest possible regard for humanity with the most alarming display of ferocious imbecility. I defy the ingenuity of journalists to persuade their public that any given member of the proletariat can have a personal grievance against astronomy. Starvation itself could hardly be dragged in there, eh? And there are other advantages. The whole civilized world has heard of Greenwich. The very bootblacks in the basement of Charing Cross Station know something of it. See? The features of Mr. Vladimir, so well known in the best society by their humorous urbanity, beamed with cynical self-satisfaction, which would have astonished the intelligent women his wit entertained so exquisitely. Yes, he continued, with a contemptuous smile, the blowing up of the first meridian is bound to raise a howl of execration. A difficult business, Mr. Verloc mumbled, feeling that this was the only safe thing to say. What is the matter? Haven't you the whole gang under your hand? The very pick of the basket? That old terrorist Yunt is here. I see him walking about Piccadilly in his green havelock almost every day. And Michaelis, the ticket of leave apostle, you don't mean to say you don't know where he is? Because if you don't, I can tell you, Mr. Vladimir went on menacingly. If you imagine that you are the only one on the secret fun list, you are mistaken. This perfectly gratuitous suggestion caused Mr. Verloc to shuffle his feet slightly. And the whole Lausanne lot, eh? Haven't they been flocking over here at the first hint of the Milan conference? This is an absurd country. It will cost money, Mr. Verloc said, by a sort of instinct. That cock won't fight, Mr. Vladimir retorted, with an amazingly genuine English accent. You'll get your screw every month, and no more till something happens. And if nothing happens very soon you won't get even that. What's your ostensible occupation? What are you supposed to live by? I keep a shop, answered Mr. Verloc. A shop? What sort of shop? Stationery, newspapers. My wife. Your what? interrupted Mr. Vladimir in his guttural Central Asian tones. My wife. Mr. Verloc raised his husky voice slightly. I am married. That be damned for a yarn, exclaimed the other in unfeigned astonishment.
married. And you a professed anarchist, too. What is this confounded nonsense? But I suppose it's merely a manner of speaking. Anarchists don't marry. It's well known. They can't. It would be apostasy. My wife isn't one, Mr. Verloc mumbled sulkily. Moreover, it's no concern of yours. Oh yes, it is, snapped Mr. Vladimir. I am beginning to be convinced that you are not at all the man for the work you've been employed on. Why, you must have discredited yourself completely in your own world by your marriage. Couldn't you have managed without? This is your virtuous attachment, eh? What with one sort of attachment and another you are doing away with your usefulness. Mr. Verloc, puffing out his cheeks, let the air escape violently, and that was all. He had armed himself with patience. It was not to be tried much longer. The first secretary became suddenly very curt, detached, final. You may go now, he said. A dynamite outrage must be provoked. I give you a month. The sittings of the conference are suspended. Before it reassembles again something must have happened here, or your connection with us ceases. He changed the note once more with an unprincipled versatility. Think over my philosophy, Mr. Mr. Verloc, he said, with a sort of chaffing condescension, waving his hand towards the door. Go for the first meridian. You don't know the middle classes as well as I do. Their sensibilities are jaded. The first meridian. Nothing better, and nothing easier, I should think. He had got up and with his thin sensitive lips twitching humorously, watched in the glass over the mantelpiece Mr. Verloc backing out of the room heavily, hat and stick in hand. The door closed. The footman in trousers, appearing suddenly in the corridor, let Mr. Verloc another way out and through a small door in the corner of the courtyard. The porter standing at the gate ignored his exit completely, and Mr. Verloc retraced the path of his morning's pilgrimage as if in a dream, an angry dream. This detachment from the material world was so complete that, though the mortal envelope of Mr. Verloc had not hastened unduly along the streets, that part of him to which it would be unwarrantably rude to refuse immortality, found itself at the shop door all at once, as if borne from west to east on the wings of a great wind. He walked straight behind the counter and sat down on a wooden chair that stood there. No one appeared to disturb his solitude. Stevie, put into a green baize apron, was now sweeping and dusting upstairs, intent and conscientious, as though he were playing at it, and Mrs. Verloc, warned in the kitchen by the clatter of the cracked bell, had merely come to the glazed door of the parlor, and putting the curtain aside a little, had peered into the dim shop. Seeing her husband sitting there shadowy and bulky, with his hat tilted far back on his head, she had at once returned to her stove. An hour or more later she took the green baize apron off her brother Stevie and instructed him to wash his hands and face in the peremptory tone she had used in that connection for fifteen years or so ever since she had, in fact, ceased to attend to the boy's hands and face herself. She spared presently a glance away from her dishing up for the inspection of that face and those hands which Stevie, approaching the kitchen table, offered for her approval with an air of self-assurance hiding a perpetual residue of anxiety. Formerly the anger of the father was the supremely effective sanction of these rites, but Mr. Verloc's placidity in domestic life would have made all mention of anger incredible even to poor Stevie's nervousness. The theory was that Mr. Verloc would have been inexpressibly pained and shocked by any deficiency of cleanliness at mealtimes. Winnie after the death of her father found considerable consolation in the feeling that she need no longer tremble for poor Stevie. She could not bear to see the boy hurt. It maddened her. As a little girl she had often faced with blazing eyes the irascible licensed vittler in defense of her brother. Nothing now in Mrs. Verloc's appearance could lead one to suppose that she was capable of a passionate demonstration. She finished her dishing up. The table was laid in the parlor. Going to the foot of the stairs, she screamed out mother.
Then opening the glazed door leading to the shop, she said quietly Adolf. Mr. Verloc had not changed his position, he had not apparently stirred a limb for an hour and a half. He got up heavily and came to his dinner in his overcoat and with his hat on, without uttering a word. His silence in itself had nothing startlingly unusual in this household, hidden in the shades of the sordid street seldom touched by the sun, behind the dim shop with its wares of disreputable rubbish. Only that day Mr. Verloc's taciturnity was so obviously thoughtful that the two women were impressed by it. They sat silent themselves, keeping a watchful eye on poor Stevie, lest he should break out into one of his fits of loquacity. He faced Mr. Verloc across the table and remained very good and quiet, staring vacantly. The endeavor to keep him from making himself objectionable in any way to the master of the house put no inconsiderable anxiety into these two women's lives. That boy, as they alluded to him softly between themselves, had been a source of that sort of anxiety almost from the very day of his birth. The late licensed Vittler's humiliation at having such a very peculiar boy for a son manifested itself by a propensity to brutal treatment, for he was a person of fine sensibilities, and his sufferings as a man and a father were perfectly genuine. Afterwards Stevie had to be kept from making himself a nuisance to the single gentleman lodgers, who are themselves a queer lot, and are easily aggrieved. And there was always the anxiety of his mere existence to face. Visions of a workhouse infirmary for her child had haunted the old woman in the basement breakfast room of the decayed Belgravian house. If you had not found such a good husband, my dear, she used to say to her daughter, I don't know what would have become of that poor boy. Mr. Verloc extended as much recognition to Stevie as a man not particularly fond of animals may give to his wife's beloved cat, and this recognition, benevolent and perfunctory, was essentially of the same quality. Both women admitted to themselves that not much more could be reasonably expected. It was enough to earn for Mr. Verloc the old woman's reverential gratitude. In the early days, made skeptical by the trials of friendless life, she used sometimes to ask anxiously, You don't think, my dear, that Mr. Verloc is getting tired of seeing Stevie about? To this Winnie replied habitually by a slight toss of her head. Once, however, she retorted, with a rather grim pertness, he'll have to get tired of me first. A long silence ensued. The mother, with her feet propped up on a stool, seemed to be trying to get to the bottom of that answer, whose feminine profundity had struck her all of a heap. She had never really understood why Winnie had married Mr. Verloc. It was very sensible of her, and evidently had turned out for the best but her girl might have naturally hoped to find somebody of a more suitable age. There had been a steady young fellow, only son of a butcher in the next street, helping his father in business, with whom Winnie had been walking out with obvious gusto. He was dependent on his father, it is true, but the business was good, and his prospects excellent. He took her girl to the theatre on several evenings. Then just as she began to dread to hear of their engagement, for what could she have done with that big house alone, with Stevie on her hands, that romance came to an abrupt end, and Winnie went about looking very dull. But Mr. Verloc, turning up providentially to occupy the first-floor front bedroom, there had been no more question of the young butcher. It was clearly providential.